<laughs> All right, I'll get started. So yeah, thank you for the introduction. And I'm so happy everyone could be here with me today. I thought I would be some nervous, but um, actually I'm excited to see everyone's face. And um, I, um, I appreciate everyone being here across the US, um, New York City, Austin, Texas, and even from South Korea. So I know it's 2 a.m., past 2 a.m. in South Korea right now, but I appreciate you guys fighting off sleep. So I promise you I will keep you awake throughout my presentation. So I'll get started. So today I'm here to talk about uh, my dissertation work, uh, which is on behavioral, physiological, and neurobiological plasticity of mice living in social hierarchies. So I wanted to start with a big picture, uh, talking about social behavior in general. So social behavior is broadly defined as the communication between two conspecifics. It could be human or any social animal that have high potential to change their subsequent behavior. So it is found across species in different forms, such as mating, parenting, affiliation, competition, and even your sociality. But regardless of the types, these social behaviors share unique qualities. So individuals make a decision to output certain social behavior based on information processed in the brain and its current uh, physiological state. This internal state includes memory, hunger, satiety, motivation or emotion, and of course, social status as well. So social interaction involves these two decision-making individuals with their own internal state. And these individuals actively detect their social partner's behavior either directly or uh, indirectly as someone's in the, uh, behavior output changes the environment. And the same thing goes to another direction. So in this process, uh, two individuals form this dynamic and mutual feedback. And it is important to note that these reciprocal feedbacks happen at the fast temporal scale as short as a milliseconds. So my research focused on one specific form of social behavior, social dominance. So social dominance is observed across species and it, it involves competition over resources such as food, territory, or mating partners. So it is also observed in species that are actively studied in the laboratory like mice and fruit flies and also found in humans. So in my research, I studied social dominance and social behavior in mice because mouse species give us advantages to study behavioral and bi biological mechanisms of these behavior with the molecular and genomic tools available. So um, dominance hierarchy exists in pair house animal as well. And then uh, this dominance hierarchy has been extensively studied in, within this pair housing system um, uh, 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 relating to neurobiology and physiology. However, we still don't know much about the process, how this unfamiliar individual form this um, dyadic relationships. And we also don't know much about how it works when animals are housed in a large social group with, the lar with um, this complex social dynamics. So therefore my research focused to fill these gaps and these are two overarching, overarching concepts across my experiments. So phenotypic plasticity is one's ability to adjust its phenotype in response to environment. And social competence adds one more layer on top of the phenotypic plasticity that, that these changes should be appropriate to the given social context. So this is just to prep you with the list of research questions I tried to answer across seven studies. So I'm gonna go over many experiments in a short amount of time. So I'm not going to go into too much details with uh, every single study. But instead, I will focus on giving you the big picture of my entire research and the connection between all these experiments. But please feel free to ask me more details at the end of my presentation. So the first experiment was done using pairs of mice to study how the two unfamiliar mice form dominance relationship over time. So we exposed the pairs of mice over, uh, for 20 minutes, over five days. And this is the first day of interaction. So each line represents the behavior of each mouse in pairs. And red tick bars are the aggressive behavior at that certain time point. And the blue tick bars is, uh, are the defensive behaviors. Um, we use this um, claim birds burst detection algorithm to show that these aggressive interactions occur in bursts rather than uniformly distributed over time. 
So in day one, um, most of the time, the, these two animals are showing aggression towards each other. But then over five days, the dominance relationship resolves. Then one mouse shows most of the aggression, and the other continues to show defensive behavior in general. But just looking at these data itself, it's hard to pinpoint at which time point they resolve their dominant subordinate relationship. There has been um, two methods suggested to determine this, but one was too stringent and one was too lenient. So in this study, we further came up with a method to determine when they exactly form stable dominance relationship using the combination of two methods, identifying pre, middle, and post phases of dominance relationship resolution. And uh, as I emphasized earlier, social interaction is dynamic and fast-paced process. So it is essential to use the method that considers the time window between two subsequent behavior exhibited by two social individuals respectively. So for example, when my friend just saw me and said, hey, how are you? And it would be awkward and not socially competent of me if I answered the question 10 minutes later saying, hey, I'm great. So um, there, ha but, but in, uh, in this, um, literature, there hasn't been a proper statistical tool to embrace this fast-paced process of social interaction. So therefore, we came up with this four slight time tilings coefficient, or four STTC, to identify significant association between the given behavior of one individual with the target behavior of another individual within specific time window. For instance, when two minds are interacting like this, um, mouse A will show certain behavior over time. Within a certain time window, we, we would like to know how many times mouse B respond with a certain behavior. So in this case, uh, this green tick bar represents mouse B's behavior following within the time window of mouse A's behavior. So this is just one example from the study. So blue dots represent the likelihood of dominant mouse showing subordinate behavior in response to lunch or biting behavior, which is aggressive behavior from his social partner. And vice versa, red dots represent how likely the subordinate mouse show defensive behavior in response to social partner's aggressive behavior. So in pre-resolution phase, uh, two mice are not that different, but as they form stable dominant relationship, subordinate mice learn to consistently show a uh, high propensity to um, exhibit this def defensive behavior when they get attacked. And dominant male uh, mice become less likely to show any defensive behavior when they see this aggression from their social partner. So uh, when studying any kinds of animal species and their behavior, especially social behavior, it is essential to take into account their natural ecology. So mice are found both in wild and near human as well. So regardless of where they live, um, mice are very flexible and able to adapt their, uh, to different environment, forming different social dynamics around them. Across different environment they live in, um, they, mice consistently show this high territorial behavior, especially in male mice. So for them, establishing their own space is such a life, life goal for them. So, and once they occupy their own space, mice constantly uh, communicate for the ownership of their territory. So in our lab, uh, we use a noble housing system to mimic the natural habitat of wild mice. In wild, mice dig the burrow under the ground for the place to sleep and rest, and they forage for food and water above the ground. So but the bottom half of the housing you see on the right side is built like the burrows with the connected cages and tubes. And this bottom half is always covered with the red panel to provide dark environment like inside the burrows. The top half provides a sufficient space for mice to explore and have social interaction. And at the top of the vivarium, uh, food and water is provided. Uh, we usually house 10 to 12 mice in one vivarium uh, for two to three weeks, depending on the experimental schedule. So this is to show you how mice interact in this housing system in general. I hope my uh, video is not jumping around because that happened before, but let's get started. So I want to draw your attention that they have unique markings on their body. That's, this is how we know each mouse's ID and record the winner and loser of the aggressive interaction. And during this group housing period, we observe their social behavior usually two to four hours per day, focusing on their aggressive interaction. 
Uh, by the way, this is, this is recorded under the dark cycle with the red lighting. So mice can't see the red light that much, while, whereas a human can see them. Um, so this is why it looks red. And um, we usually do the behavior observation um, during this dark cycle because mice are nocturnal and they are more active during this dark cycle. Moving on. There we go. So here's an example of an observational data that we collected from one social group. And it shows how mice form a so social hierarchy over time and how each, each, each individual occupies this unique social rank. So there are 12 mice in a group. And this, the x-axis is just time, then y-axis is the measure of the dominance, which is glico rating score. So in the lab, we usually use a glico rating or Davis score. But today, I'm going to focus on the glico rating. But, and then uh, glico ratings and other dominance measures we use in the lab uh, usually agree with, it, with each other. So the glico rating wasn't actually invented for the animal behavior. This is a similar type of ranking system people use all the time for chess or for tennis, NBA basketball, or even online game World of Warcraft. So in basic, each mouse gains points when they win, and then uh, they lose points when they lose. But the point they're gaining or losing is weighted based on rank difference between two individuals involved in aggressive encounters. So if underdog wins over the champion, uh, it will gain much points. But if the champion wins over the others, it will gain little points. So you'll see each line progressing over time, and each line is each mouse in the hierarchy. They all start at the initial starting points, uh, 2,200 points. So the take home message of this graph is that at the beginning, there is a fluctuation while mice are figuring out their hierarchy. And the mouse gained a lot of points at the beginning with the spike, you can see the orange line. Um, it's not necessarily the final alpha male of the hierarchy. And secondly, um, once they is established, the social hierarchy is, stays stable. As you can see, the each line becomes almost horizontal. And also you see this each mouse occupy unique social rank in the hierarchy from one to 10. In this case, so um, based on this uh, click rating Davis score or Davis score, we often categorize them into three groups, uh, starting with the alpha. So alpha is who is the highest in the hierarchy, and there are there are subdominant males who wins more fight than they lose in general, and there are subordinates who lose more fight than they win. So alpha male in the group are very territorial. They usually sleep by themselves and then uh, patrol around the housing to assert their, his dominance here and there. And subdominants are, sub, sub, subdominant males are more active than sub, subordinate in general. And they do get attacked by alpha as frequently as subordinates do, but they still go out there and show aggression when it's appropriate. So in this video, I'm going to show you one mouse is interacting with two other mice. One is more dominant than him, and the second mouse he's encountering is subordinate than him. So this mouse is approaching the first mouse, and it stays still, kind of, and then it does not show any aggression. It let the mouse, the focal mouse is letting the, the other mouse, just letting him sniff him. And it turns around and it quickly switched its mode of behavior and show aggression because it recognized the other one was subordinate than him. So I think this video nicely shows the advantage and importance of study social behavior in group housing. As we can see, mice, show, mice naturally show this behavior flexibility and socially competent behaviors. So this whole phenomenon of them uh, forming social hierarchy and maintaining it uh, led me to the second study. In this study, I asked questions. So I get it, they uh, occupy their unique social rank and then they can recognize um, them behave appropriately, but how do they actually know and communicate the social status information? And also I wanted to know what other physiological and behavior changes happen as unfamiliar mice organize themselves into stable and linear social hierarchy. So to answer this question, we turned our head to known olfactory cues used in mice. So mice use olfactory system extensively to gather information. So that's why we thought um, digging into olfactory system was a reasonable step. And mice send us signals by scent marking. 
So when they were given, uh, uh, mice were given this unfamiliar urine marking in their space, they immediately sent mark over other, um, other mice's scent to communicate the ownership of the territory. Then the, similarly in the nature, uh, when mice, um, mice actively sent mark on the border uh, when they uh, have their territory meet with their neighbor to communicate their territory boundaries. So in their scent mark, it's not just, just some uh, urine as a water and some vitamin. Um, it's just actually, unlike human, mice actively excrete protein in their urine and it's called a major urinary protein or MUFs. So these MUFs are uh, produced in the liver and it's very metaphorically expensive to produce. And there are many types of MUFs, but the male MUF20 specifically attracts females and invoke uh, courtship behavior from female. And dominant male mice will show aggression um, towards any other males when they detect MUF20 or MUF3 specifically. And the previous research showed that in diet, dominant and subordinate mice deposit their uh, these mop differently. So when two, two mice were isolated, they sent mark all over the given space, thinking they are dominant in that space. Uh, but once these mice are housed next to each other and the form dominance relationship, the dominant male maintains scent marking pattern, but then subordinate mouse limit their urination pattern at the corner of this, its cage. So we thought looking at this mop level, um, from these mice living in group housing will give us some insights how they communicate their unique social rank. So we measure, simply measure the MUP level over 20, 19 days repeatedly from each individual. This is what one, we saw what one data from the one specific cohort. Um, so the takeaway from this graph is that first, Alpha male produce muffs more than anyone in the hierarchy. Second, uh, while uh, these highly ranked animals like rank two, three, four uh, invest more muffs than subordinate animals, but the muff itself is not a direct reflection of social rank. So in other words, we can't just look at muff production level and then know their unique social, social rank. Also, they do not differ much at the beginning, but as they form the social hierarchy, you can see alpha male consistently increase its mob level over time. And this is another graph with the same data, just to emphasize that how much mob um, alpha male make compared to other individuals. So we also found that alpha males produce high volume of urine per day. So we can infer the volume of the urine uh, they produce per day by looking at the creatinine level in the urine. So creatinine is the byproduct of muscle metabolism and it is produced similar level each day, but urination volume can fluctuate. So lower creatinine level indicates higher volume of urine produced per day. So you can see in the graph, the rank one mouse um, across multiple social groups have significantly lower creatinine level Again, high urine volume they produce per day. So with this graph, we can infer alpha male is urinating a lot, probably all over the group housing vivarium to send out the um, social signal. And the amounts they produce increase over the group housing period. So this, this, this finding led me to a new question. Like, do they change their other behavior to keep up with this investment in muffs and urinating, urination volume? especially alpha males. So to answer this question, we installed the GoPro cameras at the top of the vivarium near the food hopper and measured how often they eat or drink over a 24 hour period. So they sometimes eat together like this or sometimes one mouse is chased off by the other. The other. And the data was pretty much what we expected, which happens not as often as you think. And um, again, this x-axis is a time um, in the minute scale. And then the y-axis is social rank. The higher in the y-axis -ax is, is more dominant. So this is an example from one social group. And it shows clearly that alpha male eat and drink more frequently throughout the day. So pretty much like throughout the day, it eat and drink and then power nap here and then keep going. So again, we looked at across like six, 16 social groups and the pattern was the same, clearly dominant males eat and drink more frequently. We also looked at the data a bit differently and examined how long their longest period of inactivity in eating or drinking. 
And you, as you can see, alpha males just have the shortest period of between foraging bouts, suggesting um, they, uh, they would have a reduced sleep in general. And further, we use the social network analysis to compare social networks of forcing behavior and aggressive interaction. So the y-axis represents how often mice engage in aggressive interaction, and uh, x-axis, and the y-axis represents how often two mice forage next to each other. So there's a negative association between two network measures, meaning mice, and, mice avoid foraging with others. Uh, they have engaged aggressive interaction before. So like we saw above, investing metabolic energy comes with a cost. And re it requires a risk corresponding adjustment in behavior and physiology. And animals have limited amount of energy they can utilize. So they have to show some sort of trade-off in energy investment in various ways. So for example, the birds trade off between saving energy during sleep and their safety. Birds in a good energy condition sacrifice some energy to sleep more safely with its head untucked. Whereas the birds in poor energy condition sacrifice vigilance to save energy while sleeping unsafely with his head tucked in. Another example is the peacock I mentioned earlier. The male peacocks invest a significant amount of energy to uh, advertise its reproductive state and dominance. So in, in, in the cost of increasing predation risk and other health outcome. And again, we saw male mice invest energy in similar purpose. So one of the physiological systems that requires consistent energy investment is also immune system. So in this study, I asked question whether social status is associated with the immune function. And also aside from the perspective of ener energetic trade-off, Social, sub social subordination has been um, suggested as a major fa stress factor comprom compromising immune system. So I had like two different reasons, uh, not, not, not so different, two reasons to look at this immune system. So our immune sy system is very, very complicated. And here I am just presenting very basic, most basics of it. But there are two different immune response, innate and adaptive. Innate immunity is the first line of the war zone fighting off any harmful intruders in your immune system, which is also called antigen, and it involves an inflammatory response. An adaptive immune system is second line fighting off intruder with the antibodies. So these days we do hear a lot about these antibodies. So these antibodies are produced through this adaptive immune response. So in general, more energy is required to use this innate immune response than adaptive immune response. Uh, in the majority, majority of this previous literature, immune system has been studied more considering social stress by so subordination rather than energetic trade-off. So in general, uh, previous work suggests that social subordination or social defeat uh, is associated with the prime innate immune system or high level of inflammation. So for example, um, here, when, when you have this uh, high neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, um, this is a clinically used um, biomarker of the systemic inflammation. So if you have high NLR, that means your body is going through some inflammatory response. And then uh, in subordinate individuals, uh, the adaptive immune system was uh, generally decreased. So using flow cytometry, we measured proportion of immune cells in mice blood after two weeks of group housing, and we found a similar pattern as previous literature. So in y-axis, there are, there, there are different types of immune cells we find, we find in the mouse blood. And when you see the bar on the right side of the gray line, that means that dominant male have higher proportion of that cell. And then vice versa, if you see the bar on the left side, that means the subordinate individual have higher proportion of that cell. So uh, in general, uh, we do see that dominant males invest more in adaptive immunity, as you see, uh, it's, it's shown as a high, uh, higher number of B cells and then cytotoxic T cells. And subordinate mice are more prone to use um, innate immunity, as you see in the higher number of neutrophils. So this lines up well with our hypothesis that alpha male would choose cheaper immune system as a trade-off of their investment in reproduction and territory defense. So this is brief summary of uh, study two to four from alpha male mice perspective. So once a mouse establishes itself as an alpha in the hierarchy, it will produce more mops in the liver and excrete in the urine. 
And in parallel, the wool scent mark more as it's as inferred by this increased urination volume. And to keep up with all that, it will increase drinking and, and eating. And also as a trade-off of this shift in energy investment, alpha males utilize metabolically cheaper adaptive immun immunity more. So we found out many aspects of behavioral and physiological changes happening in mice living in this social complex environment. Um, and there, there's, uh, there's much to learn more about this mechanism, how the brain is involved in these all processes. So the first thing we touched upon was social neuropeptides, oxytocin and vasopressin. So these new neuropeptides were, are found across many species, such as rodents, primates, and human. And they are extensively studied in the context of social behavior, such as pair bonding, social recognition, social reward, maternal behavior, aggression. Um, what have you, so yeah. So however, but there hasn't been a specific study that looking at uh, association between social status and to a uh, signaling system of these two neuropeptides, especially in the context of a larger social environment. So we collaborated with Alex and Lisa at Cornell, uh, looking at this oxytocin receptor and vasopressin receptor density throughout the brains of alpha, subdominant, and subordinate mice. So this is exemplar brain section containing nucleus accumbent brain region. This nucleus accumbent brain region is involved in reward system and dopamine signaling. And the darker staining in this section shows that oxytocin receptors in the nucleus accumbent core. So nucleus accumbent core was the brain region that had the biggest effect size, where both alpha and subdominant male mice show higher oxytocin receptor density compared to subordinate mice. So this was quite an uh, interesting result because previous literature showed this brain region and the ox some uh, oxytocin, oxytocin signaling in this brain region is associated with the motivation to engage in social interaction. So it could be just initiating aggressive interaction or just exploring and sniffing other social partner. So we, th uh, so we thought um, uh, the behavior pattern we see in this barbarian where the alpha or subdominant males usually initiate this social interaction a social, aggressive social interaction. So we thought this um, could be related to the in increased um, level of the oxytocin density, oxytocin receptor density in the nucleus accumbent. And another aspect we looked at in mouse brain was a gene expression pattern associated with the social status. Because we are using mice, we could take brain tissues from mice with different social status then take advantage of RNA sequencing technology to pro profile whole transcriptome in many brain regions. So we profile many brain regions, but today I'm focusing on arcade nucleus and ventral media hypothalamus. These two brain regions are very closely located in the brain. And these brain regions are interesting to look at because um, they contain this very tightly uh, um, controlled feeding regulation neural circuits. The feeding circuits are highly conserved across species from simple organisms to mice and even human. And food intake and energy expenditure is obviously directly related to survival of any animals. So this behavior is tightly regulated in the brain. Um, then the, so this RK nucleus and BMH is a, re, a brain region that will in, uh, that integrates a signal from peripheral organs such as pancreas, stomach, and fat tissues. Um, then further modulate this feeding behavior. So after two weeks of group housing, we collected uh, brain tissues from the mice and then we dissected uh, BMH and ARC brain region and analyzed the transcription, transcription profiles of alpha, beta, and the most subordinate males. Uh, from, and we used uh, the social groups using this study was 11, so we total have a 30, 33 individual as a sample size. Then first we found that alpha males um, show uh, different gene expression um, profile compared to beta and subordinate in, in that they show they have a, almost 270 respectively different, differentially expressed genes. But then when we look at the beta uh, versus subordinate, they, they only had a two genes that are differentially expressed. The one of the important differentially express, expressed genes are this HRP and MPY. So these genes are generally involved in promoting food intake and increasing energy expenditure. So when animals are in hunger state, they two, these two genes are highly expressed. 
So, but the, what's puzzling was that um, another gene that has opposite effect, POMC, was also downregulated in the alpha males. So, but just looking at some other genes, such as oxytocin I presented here, not all genes are downregulated in alphas. So, while this like, results are, they are indeed puzzling, one of my hypotheses for this result is that after two weeks, alpha male have eaten sufficient food over time, as we saw from the previous experiment, and it is not in hunger state anymore. So it doesn't need more food intake. So as alpha males cons constantly eat food, its digestive, digestive system will send out the satiety signal to the brain. Uh, that's why, probably why MPY and HGRP is downregulated. Um, but as alpha male continues to eat more food, POMC should be also, also activated as a part of the negative feedback loop, receiving the satiety signal and further decrease, further to decrease this food intake. But um, to keep up with this new shift in their energy investment in MOFs and territory marking, this satire signal might have to be overridden by some other brain region involved in social information processing. So that's my hypothesis. I also applied this weighted gene co-expression analysis, which is fre frequently used to analyze RNA sequencing data to find clusters of genes expressed together then I, 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 I could identify these uh, hops genes that are highly connected to each other uh, with other genes. And this um, gene network uh, graph shows that uh, they are just listing the bunch of hop genes that I found from this analysis and then show how closely these genes are um, connected together. So among all these hop genes, I would like to point out this galanin gene. So galanin is involved in variety of regulation such as metabolism, growth hormone release, body temperature, and um, reproductive behavior. So galanin could, galanin could be a good candidate gene to delve into further to um, dissect the mechanism of gene expression changes alpha male is going through. Lastly, um, I studied how given social information is processed in multiple brain regions and also the interaction between this uh, social information processing and the internal state, particularly social status. So to answer uh, these questions I have, I designed a study where I have four different types of social cues. So when I say social cues, I use urine. I use collected urine from either alpha or the most subordinate mice. And at this point, I believe I convinced you uh, that this mops in general and urine has a lot of social information, and then alpha and the most subordinate mice have different mob contents in their urine. And they also differ in familiarity. So uh, some mice were exposed to cues from the mouse they lived in the same hierarchy, and the other were exposed to the cues from, collected from the mouse they never encountered. So that's how, how we have four different social cues here. And so to um, make this a bit two different um, condition as like familiar versus unfamiliar, I always ran um, social groups, two social groups in parallel to generate this um, familiar versus unfamiliar social cues. Then I exposed these four different cues to either dominant and subordinate mice, generating total eight experimental groups. So I have two exemplar brain regions here, uh, but we did the whole brain mapping. So we collected this, um, neuronal activity uh, in response to social cues throughout three, 23 di different brain regions. So x-axis is are the so four social cues and the y-axis is the number of CFOS immunoactive cells found in e each brain region. Then this is the mo molecular marker of neur neur neuronal activity. And the purple box plus uh, represents the um, data from the dominant subject, and then yellow represents the data from the subordinate subject. So in this media amygdala, um, both dominant and subordinate mice show significantly high neuroactivation when they were exposed to alpha social cues, regardless of familiarity. But when we see this through ventral media hypothalamus, dominant subjects show specific high response to unfamiliar alpha cue. But then, on the other hand, subordinate subjects show high neural response to alpha cues in general, regardless of familiarity again. So in BMH, we see this uh, individual social status is interacting with the neural activation pattern responding to the given social cue.
Then I also use the flexible linear discriminant analysis to reconstruct the classification of eight experimental groups using the whole brain mapping data. So what I did here is that just looking at this brain activation data collected from each individual throughout 23 brain regions, we want, I want to see um, whether this model can classify which experimental group each subject came from. And indeed, this model successfully classified each individual to the, their own uh, experimental groups. And then one of the uh, nice thing about this, um, this analysis is that I could also identify which brain region is, um, is driving this classification strongly. And not surprisingly, we found this media prefrontal cortex, which is involved in a lot of high cognitive function, and also the other five brain regions that um, belongs that are suggested as a social behavior network. So overall, throughout my seven experiments, I studied the unique and complex nature of the social behavior. And I have shown how social experience leads to plastic and adaptive changes in mice uh, living in social hierarchies. Thank you so much for listening. And I would like to thank my committee member, collaborator, and past and current Curly Champagne Lab members and undergrad RAs I work with. And then thanks to Samsung Scholarship Foundation and Columbia University Dean's Fellowship, my PhD was fully funded. And lastly, I thank my friends and family who are here to share this moment with me. Thank you. Thank you, Juan, that was terrific. So um, James, perhaps you can um, moderate the, the questions. We could spend a few, few minutes on questions. Sure. Um, so, uh, Juan, what I'll do is I'll, I'll ask some of the questions in chat. I think we'll have time for, you know, a, a few questions from the audience, if anybody has any questions. And, and then after that, we'll go to the defense part. So you, you maybe already read them, but I'll just read them in case people can't, uh, aren't reading the chat. So the first question was from Dr. Orsini. Do similar social hierarchies exist in female mice? Yes, uh, so uh, we uh, usually use male mice, but and we also did another study uh, using, um, looking at the female mice social hierarchy. So female mice uh, do form social hierarchy, but um, we noticed that uh, the uh, linearity and uh, linearity of this hierarchy is not as strong in females. And then um, they, they, sometimes there, there are some, uh, so in male, male mice hierarchy, usually the alpha male is the, the one driving the whole social dynamic, uh, dictating this whole social dynamic. Dynamic, but in female hierarchy, that that whole um, dynamics are a little bit different. Where so maybe one or two, or, or sometimes three top individual will um, have this dominance pretty much shared, and then um, uh, have a more relaxed uh, hierarchy in general in females. Okay, um, and there's another question here from uh, Dr. Young, Becca Young. How did you identify module hub genes and have you compared these genes to other functional categorizations of gene co-expression modules? Yeah, I, so um, I followed uh, certain papers. Um, so I had a specific uh, cutoff for the, so in the WGCNA analysis, as you know, um, there's a module uh, significance, eigengene significance. So they have, a, so it, so throughout this WGCNA analysis, I get a bunch of numbers of how this uh, gene is uh, connected and the correlation and co correlated with other genes, and then also how significant the correlation is. So I had a bunch of uh, cutoff numbers from I got from the other papers and other previous studies using WGCN analysis to um, select um, hub genes for each uh, from the each module. And then I think I answered the first question. And then how? Yes. Yeah, so I uh, did a um, the Go analysis, gene ontology analysis with these um, expressed gene, I'm not sure I'm answering your question right, but I'm dead. So I use this um, gene ontology uh, analysis to look at uh, how, what kind of functional function they have is bi biologically. And then a bunch of the genes that I found um, as a hub gene, they were involved in um, plasticity genes, such as um, synaptic plasticity, and some, some were um, involved in the le uh, cognitive learning. 
Becca says you answered her question, which is good. Um, and Caitlin, another question from Caitlin. Yeah, sorry. Um, I just had yes. another question. Uh, you can read it, but just to say it out loud, do I imagine hormones probably play a role, and I'm just not familiar with this literature, but do you know whether, I guess it could be the case in, in males and females, but um, whether levels of testosterone or estrogen actually correlate with hierarchy, the social rank in the hierarchy? And yep. like whether hormonal manipulations can actually affect mm. where they fall. Like if you were to castrate a male mouse, would you see a change? Um, so in our own setting, we, uh, my colleague Kate was here, uh, she did um, a hormonal study. So in male hierarchy, um, there's, when we just looking at just uh, across different social group, there's no um, particular difference across the different social rank. But when we look at specifically look at these um, certain social group with the um, di uh, very despotic alpha male. So when there's like, there's a whole uh, dictatorship is going on in this um, hierarchy, then then we, we see this higher testosterone level in the alpha compared to subordinate. So um, this social dynamic in within the hierarchy matters within, when it comes to the testosterone level. And and in female hierarchy, we saw this um, very small effect size, but a um, higher estrogen level in um, higher high high ranked in, in individual. Yeah. yeah. And um, I took so to answer. So even though we didn't do the study, so only earlier in the study, I know one little uh, study they castrated all male mice, and then they did let them form the hierarchy. So the, the factor was that when they castrate them before the puberty and then they would not form the hierarchy. But then once you castrate them after their puberty, then they still form some sort of a hierarchy. Maybe not as aggressive and maybe not as active, but they still form some sort of hierarchy. Awesome, thank you. Uh, one, uh, we have a question from Juan Dominguez, Dr. Dominguez. Um, it's a long one, but in, in, in short, I can explain it as like, how, how does the differences in the plasticity that you see in the physiological changes, how do you think that would translate to a more natural context, uh, especially because, for instance, individuals may be dominant in one context, but perhaps in a separate uh, group, they may be a subordinate or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm reading the question. The actual question rather than my <laughs> deep version. I see, um, I see. That's a very interesting question. Um, I guess the like, guy always like thought about it as my mouse perspective rather than human most of the time. But um, um, if I have to hypothesize um, in human, I think you can stick with mouse just for the first part of the question. Just just say uh, you know right. just the mups. How do you think the mups would vary according to the natural context? like natural context in terms of um, where there's, there's like different changes in social rank, right? So yeah. I think, um, um, is, for example, the mob level will fluctuate very much um, when there's some sort of a displacement in the uh, social rank, uh, because like actually having higher mob in general will, um, if you're higher, high, high in the social hierarchy, higher, having higher mob is beneficial to like, pro, um, advertise your reproduction and stuff, but um, once you have a higher mob, even though you're like a lower rank, then it, that increases the risk of getting attacked by the high, more dominant individual in the hierarchy. So, um, and also uh, this mob level um, is very um, affected by also stress level in general, uh, and stress hormones as, as well. So um, I think uh, it, I will see very big change in the mob level in regarding other uh, physiology when they change their social status um, in the hierarchy. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I think both those last two questions touch on the question of stability versus um, when groups are changed. All, uh, all the work you presented is on, are on stable groups. Yeah, and right. just to add, um, so when, when I presented the Bob graph with the time series, um, sometimes, so you do see some male mice have a really high Bob level at the beginning of the hierarchy, or beginning of the group housing, but then they suddenly lose. They, they, those mice are usually the aggressive ones. They start with aggressive behavior, aggressive 
high level of aggression, but then sometimes they lose one or so twice and they just suddenly become really subordinate and then they also um, decrease their MOP level as well. Okay, so one, I think we have one more question and because we need to save some questions for the defense. Obviously, we don't want everyone to take all the questions because then we will have no questions left. So this, this last question is from Kayla and uh, she asks uh, if you have predictions as to what's driving the differences that you see between dominant and subordinate mice in terms of the adaptiveness, the innate immunity profiles, mm. the, the immunophenotypes that you observed. Um, I thought about that question as well. I, I don't have like a hundred percent answer, but I think there's a lot of um, hormonal effects, especially some sort of um, um, this um, hormone such as insulin and any like growth hormone, which is not necessarily, um, we think like instantly when we talk about social behavior, whereas testosterone or estrogen, we talk about this hormones a lot as in, uh, in the context of social behavior. But I think um, because the immune system is such a, such a um, it requires a lot of energy, I think any kind of uh, energy related, uh, metabolism related hormone will drive this, um, um, this uh, difference in the immune system uh, between subordinate and dominant mice. Um, okay, well, thank you to everybody who came to listen to the talk. Uh, it's really appreciated and your support for one is really appreciated. And thank you from me and from and from Juan. Um, so I think what we'll do now is uh, we'll say goodbye to everybody, Juan. And uh, you're getting lots of claps, which is great. Um, and and uh, <laughs> thank you, everyone. And um, we shall. Uh, everybody who's on the committee will stay, and then we'll talk about how that progresses in a moment. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Francis may have to, uh, let's see, I'll let Francis do the, uh, the honors. This is, hey. the, we're down to just us, right? Yeah. Bye, Ray. Love everyone.